welcome to a conversation with Peter Brook. Peter is the creative supervisor at Jim Henson's Creature Shop in Los Angeles and is an elected sculpture member of the National Sculpture Society. He will be joined here on screen by Mark Edward Adams in San Diego. Mark is an NSS board member and sculptor. This program was Mark's idea and is presented on behalf of the NSS community in Southern California, of which he is the ambassador. Great, welcome, gentlemen. Hello. Oh, very nice to be here. <laughs> likewise, likewise. I'll give a brief intro introduction, um, Gwen. So um, Peter Brook is a, a true creative. I've been a fan of his for many, many years. Uh, some people know him mainly through his work in the movies, such as uh, Where the Wild Things Are and The Dark Crystal. Others know him from his fine art. He won a gold medal for sculpture in the California Art Club. He studied with some fantastic sculptors, including Floyd DeWitt, uh, George Carlson, Stanley Blyfeld, and he's managed to balance both worlds, but it both comes from the same space. And I think he can kind of help creatives in whatever they're doing as far as teaching us some of the processes and just some of the challenges that we face as we do this as well. And um, I know that we have a video, if, if you want to share it, Gwen, just about some of the work that Peter does. So here I am in Jim Henson's Creature Shop here in Burbank, California. Um, I'm going to attempt to give you a very brief overview of the kind of things that we make here at the Creature Shop, which range from uh, fantasy uh, creatures, like I'm standing in front of here for Dark Crystal, over to more Muppet-style puppets and uh, more cartoon-style puppets. Um, as I say, I'm standing in front of these characters for the Dark Crystal, and The Dark Crystal was a movie that was released in 1982, and uh, Jim Henson and Frank Oz directed it. And this was really the beginning of The Creature Shop, um, as we know it. Um, these, uh, once these characters had been built and the film had been shot, uh, Jim wanted to keep together um, all the craftspeople and artisans that he'd formed to make these characters. And he decided to open up a place called The Creature Shop, which was originally in London. And that's where I started back in the late 80s. In the case of these Dark Crystal characters, typically they're um, sculpted first in oil-based clay or water-based clay. And then we mold them very much in a traditional um, or, or typical style of mold making in that oftentimes silicon with a hard jacket on it, uh, much like you would find in a foundry. Um, but then we run the um, the, the characters' heads and the skins in a, in a substance called foam latex, which is a very spongy, skin-like um, material. Uh, for example, this is, foam, this is a foam latex skin that's being painted on this particular character. The way these guys are operated, in this case, the puppeteer is actually buried in the body of the, um, of the character, and the hand comes up into the head like, very much like this, so they they operate the character like this, and they see by using a, a very small television monitor, which is usually strapped to their chest. And that television monitor has a feed from the camera, so that they see what the camera's seeing, and then the puppeteer can navigate around the set. Here's a selection of head sculptures for all the characters in uh, The Dark Crystal Age of Resistance, which was uh, a 10-part um, episodic um, show that we did for Netflix uh, in 2019. Here we've got some characters from the TV show Dinosaurs and in actual fact this show was the one that I worked on that brought me to Los Angeles in 1991. Um, here we've got Earl Sinclair and Baby Sinclair. Ba uh, Earl was a big animatronic character and when I say animatronics I mean that it, it within the skin here of the head there are all sorts of mechanisms that will allow the eyes to move, full rotation, eye blinks, brows, nose, lips, and of course the jaw up and down. So here's an example of what I mean by animatronics. There's, this head is packed with radio control servos, and when the servos move, 
these various levers. For example, it can move this eye lid and essentially blink the eye. There are other mechanisms here to make the mouth move, browse, and so on and so forth. Bailey Sinclair here is a fairly traditional hand puppet, although in this case he was sculpted first, as opposed to um, patterning a, a, a sheet piece of foam, um, which is traditionally how the, the Muppets were made. Over here, we've got some more sort of fantastical characters and you can see kind of the level of detail that we often have to bring to these guys. Um, for example, on this character, the, all the hair has been individually punched to give it a realistic look. The eyes are made in-house. But it gives, a good, it gives you a good kind of sense of what, when we say creatures, this is kind of what we mean. Over here, though, is an original um, puppet of Oscar from Sesame Street. And again, you can see that stylistically, this is much more akin to the Muppet style than the creature style. So here's an example of what we call a cable mechanism. And that just basically means that the movement of this tail, in this case, or tentacle, is achieved by the use of cables, pretty much like you would find in a, um, a bike brake type cable. Um, there's eight cables, four operate this section and four operate this section, the top section. And when I move these levers like this, I can get a pretty convincing tail or tentacle movement. And when this mechanism is covered in a, say, a sculpted tentacle and run in foam latex, we can achieve a pretty realistic looking tentacle. Okay, so I know it's brief, but um, I hope this gave you a little bit of an indication as to what kind of things we do here at Jim Henson's Creature Shop. Um, now back to my conversation with Mark. Wonderful. That was a wonderful video, Peter. Thank you for sharing that with us. So I'm just going to go right into it. So yep. you created some iconic movies. And a lot of time, these movies are based on things that have been done before, such as The Dark Crystal. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've the new one is fantastic. It's like Game of Thrones as far as the drama. Very different than the pre previous version, but I can't say which is my favorite. And then mm -hmm. as far as Where the Wild Things Are, for instance, you take Maurice Sendik, that Where the Wild Things Are book is iconic. And I guess so the question is, how do you reinvent something which has been done before in your own voice? And this can also be if you're doing a portrait of somebody or if you're doing a monument of a horse that's been done before or the pose. Hmm. Well, that's a, that's a deep question. <laughs> um, first off, you know, I'm very honored to be here and thank you everybody for showing up and, and listening to our conversation. Um, I, uh, in, in, to answer you, your, your question, it's, uh, certainly when it comes to movies and like say doing wild things, um, you know, Maurice was around at the time, Maurice Sendak. And so <clears throat> we had many, um, in that case, sort of video, you know, Skype, I think it was back in those days, uh, conversations with Maurice, uh, where we would find out how much, how much we could deviate from the book illustrations in order to try and make something that looked a little bit more real. Um, and that's the case with a lot of things, like you know, when I did Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles way back when, um, you know, that, that was another uh, main conversation was how, how do we take something which is essentially 2D and create it in 3D um, and how do they move and so on and so forth. Now then in terms of um, like a horse monument or you know, do it, doing, you know, if we're talking about fine, more fine art sculpture, um, Really, the uh, you know the argument could be could be made that everything's been done before. So why I mean why even bother doing another horse monument? But 
I think it's taken me a long, long time to to realize that certainly with my own work that really you just have to try and find your own truth uh, uh, to the subject. Um, uh, it's one can very in, in the at the beginning of your career, you know, when you're just starting out, you can get um, heavily influenced by other images, other people, other other uh, you know sculptures that you've seen, or indeed you you know you fall into that category of trying to trying to follow a, a um, an established like copying a certain style, should we say, you know? And I think we all tend to do that, um, but it, it takes a long time to. Um, to to try and break away from that thought process and and just and just find your own truth. Um, now in the movies, it, it, it's a little different because it's essentially a commercial gig, you know. Um, so um, th there there is a th there's a there's an end point, uh, which is often decided. <laughs> so certainly nowadays is often decided by a whole committee of people. Um, you, you know, back when I started, like when, when Jim Henson was alive, if Jim liked it, then we, it was a go. <laughs> um, and it was a, the, 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 um, the approval uh, stage, you know, the approval process back when Jim was around was, um, was, was pretty streamlined. If Jim liked it, good to go. Um, but over the years um, in the movie world, um, you know, it's become more corporate, uh, more corporate and so forth. So there's lots of different people who need to weigh in to, to approve something. That said, um, there is an end, th th there's a fairly definite end point, uh, which is, um, you know, creating a character that we will be ultimately believe in and that will move and perform well and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, with, 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 the own, with my own work and with, you know, pe people doing fine art, sculpture, um, th the end point is determined by you yourself, I should imagine. Uh, possibly a deadline. Um, I should imagine deadlines yeah, come into it. And not many, in many cases, deadlines are, um, are a, a necessary um, part of the process, I, I think. You know, it, it pushes you to, to finish something on time. But um, in my case, you know, I'll, I'll spend oh, months, if not years, you know, tweaking a piece because I I haven't got that kind of set deadline for my own for my own um, for my own work. Um, well, you bring up an excellent point. Like, I mean, there's many ways I can follow up with this question, but one of them that really stuck to me was what you just said about continually working on pieces. Hmm. I think of somebody like Rodan who hmm. worked his whole life, or his, not his whole life, his last 20 or so years on the gates of hell, even after the museum that was going to be built for was no longer going to be built. He continued working on this. He never finished and he died. And at what point do you stop saying either give it to the world, destroy it or keep working on it? Like, cause you can work on it forever and never show your work. Well, you can. You can, and yeah, the, um, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, whew, that's a good question as well. I mean, the I, I think at a certain point, you in yourself, you, you, you reach a conclusion is it worth do I am I going to tweak it? Am I just going to do another one in the same, say, let's say the same pose and same gesture or what have you and keep on doing it, or um. Or do I call it call it quits and say right this is this is ready to be uh, cast up? Um, I think at a certain point you 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 actually have to you know be honest with yourself and say is it is it worth casting up and and, and if it is go ahead and do it you know um, the uh, in Rodan's case I mean he would it's the fact that he would have loads of the plaster figures and fragments around and he he put them in different um uh, you know combinations and what have you and ultimately a piece might actually spring from that i mean that just really speaks to the the, the fact that he was always um in, in a creative mode i think you know he was um and, and that that is something which is at times hard to maintain um, but if you're always 
thinking in a creative way, then um, I think you'll stay on top of whether you're just tweaking it to death and, and or whether you're actually <laughs> or whether you're actually committed to to an end point, you know, where the piece is finished. So if you're tweaking something like I used to work like if you would have a model in front of you, whether it's an animal or a human, like mm. you could be there for three hours. But you'll notice the first hour it's great, and the next two hours you're just kind of making it worse. Sure. Yeah. When you have a job, you have deadlines, you have a commission, you have to get it done. I mean, you have to come in every day, right, to be yeah. in that zone. How do you keep that going year after year? Well, <laughs> I think that's that's what being a professional is is about, you know. Um, because you you can't every day, you, you know, be working at a really super high level of creativity. You you, you can't. Um, at least I can't. But you know, so it it varies. But at the very least, um, th there's a there's a threshold, if you will, where you have to at least attain that kind of threshold. And anything above it, it is is a uh, is is um, is all the good stuff, you know. But so, in other words, like when I'm when I'm doing things in movies, that then, um, you, you know, there's there's generally a set um, group of parameters. There's a there's a there's a there's a goal that we need to achieve, and so if we at the very least achieve that, we're good. Um, and then anything else on top of that is better. Now then, in terms of my own work, when I'm saying tweaking things, it I do have a there, there's a reasoning behind what what I'm doing. You know that, that for example, um, light has become very important to me in the way the light hits a form, um, and so therefore you'll see. You know, I'll take them outside, take pieces outside, in various different light sources, and even even you know like try a, a, a flashlight on something in the dark, that kind of thing, uh, just just to find out the way the light. Um, follows the the forms and until it it creates a uh, how can we say a, a, until until the light creates a sense of poetry if you like over the over the form um, then I'll I'll continue to tweak it but but uppermost in my mind or it is is this sense of okay how how is the light affecting the the the, the image the forms. You know, so when I'm saying I'm tweaking, I'm not just sort of arbitrarily, you know, but no, I'll change the leg or I'll change the head and do this. You know, at a certain point, you're comfortable with the gesture, you're more or less comfortable with the forms. You're refining it to the point where it all ties together. Like, for instance, you know, I mean, that's really interesting. I'm actually curious for an example, like the one behind you. I think that's a Jaguar. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and what's the story behind that piece, and how did you get to that point? I mean, did you have the animal in front of you? Were you, did you have a purpose before you did it? No, I was doing it well. I, I got doing, um, I got back into doing animals and, and what have you um, a, a while back. I'd done animals early on, uh, and then I, I did some a lot of figurative work, and then I, I went and, and I. Uh, I'm out, and I I started to get back doing doing animals. Initially, I started doing like mountain lions and things like that because we have them in the neighborhood. Um, not that I've seen them in the wild necessarily, but I've seen lots of people's security camera footage. Um, uh, but um, that said, I was doing mountain lions, so I just went to a, local, a facility about an hour and a half north of here that had a bunch of big cats. It was a breeding uh, compound, and. Um, and I went there many times and um, just came away with a lot of, you know, sketches and photographs and um, a certain pose that the, the Jaguar did really spoke to me. And, and I started to do Jaguars and, and leopards and expand the whole thing from just solely doing mountain lions to a bunch of big cats. Um, and um, what I tend to find is uh, uh, that I don't, I mean, I, I have sculpted from life, as they say, <clears throat> in the zoo, but it's, it doesn't really work for me. Um, it, it's, 
I'm better off just taking a sketchbook and a camera and then coming back and letting it all, um, letting, it, letting all those images digest and then I'll, I'll hit doing a, a piece in the, in the safety of my studio. And, um, and normally the, the gesture kind of um, is what I would start with. There's a spark where I'm, like, I'm thinking, oh, that's, there's something in that pose, in that gesture, and I'll start working on that. And then inevitably, it, I start adjusting it and, and I start looking at it perhaps less like a Jaguar and more like a piece of sculpture and trying to figure out um, how the forms work with each other and so on and so forth. So I don't sort of slavishly take a photograph and, and you know, copy it as such. But it's fair to say that, you know, photographs are all my reference. I mean, that I, I look at them quite often uh, during the process uh, because you also want to get, uh, a, you, you want to try and, in the case of this, you know, I'm working on it, I'm struggling just to find why it's a Jaguar and not a, another type of cat. No. You know, that's that's a very controversial topic as far as whether to just have the model in front of you. Like some sculptors I've been taught will say, you're going to, you can tell when it's not a live model in front of you, you're missing the energy. Mm -hmm. Others say you, it doesn't matter. You can tweak it. And you see examples of both like Bugatti had the animals in front of him. He usually did everything at once. Mm -hmm. um, but for some animals, you can't have them hold a pose like a bird or a hawk. Sure. So, I mean, at what would you say in the beginning, you need a model or can you start off straight away? And is that something that develops over time? Like the ability <laughs> to take it. Ooh, interesting. Well, I, I, you know, I would, I can understand why, why it would be controversial. This sculpting from life thing, um, and and I know Bugatti, Rembrandt Bugatti is the is the, um, you, you, you know, the 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 recognised like you know master of uh, deity of um, of animal sculpture, and he did indeed sculpt from life. But you got to remember that back in those days. Sculpting from, I mean, the, the animals were in very small pens and, um, it, you know, it was, it was different than going to a zoo nowadays where, you know, the, 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 sometimes they're in a big habitat, you know, and you, you can hardly see them. You know, I remember going to the, when I was doing another Jaguar piece, I, I went to the LA Zoo because they've got one there and I just needed to just take a look at one. Well, I, I got there about 11 a.m. and I, don't, I think it was about 4 p.m. before the guy actually showed, you know, mm -hmm. from the bush and I had about, four minutes of looking <laughs> looking at him parading or you know walking around right. the enclosure and then it was gone again um whereas when Bugatti was sculpting he he you know they were in like very small pens and so he had you know he could just look at it all the time so it's a slight bit slight bit different in his day um but I do think it's important for me I think it's important to see the animal that, that I'm working on. And, and indeed, if when I was doing the figures, I used lots of live models, that all the figures were based off of live, live models. Um, but at a certain point, um, I don't need the live model there all the time. You know, um, it, it's, but, but I do need, I, I do need to, particularly with the animals, I need to see the animal and, and sort of, for a long period of time or over several visits to a zoo or, you know, I'm uh, working on a whole bunch of deer things. And we, I get a lot of deer just at the top of the road here. So, you know, whenever I see a deer, I just stop and just, just, just observe. And that getting that sense of deerness or whatever it is, or, you know, catness or whatever animal I'm working on, just getting that sense of what they are, what they're about, how they move and so on and so forth. And that, that's really important. And I think that's what's, when people say, oh, I sculpt from life, um, it, uh, just this actually observing your subject for an extended period of time, really looking closely at it, it is really the most important aspect of it, I, I, I've, I've found. So when you were, like, I know some of your work has been done based on things you saw in the wildlife yeah, specifically in Africa, I know the antelope was yeah. based on a real experience. Like, 
what was your inspiration when you saw the animals or maybe tell us a little bit, bit about your trip to Africa and how that kind of affected your sculpting? Well, it, it was, it was an, it was a, I mean, it was a trip of a lifetime. Okay. Um, I went with a very good sculptor called Bart Walter, who's a, a I believe he's a, a, a fellow actually of the National Sculpt Society. Anyway, Bart invited me um, to, to join him um, in the Maasai Mara, and, and I was just absolutely thrilled. It had been something I'd wanted to do since being a young kid. And, and so I, I, we did, and we had a, about a month um, in the Mara, and you know, I filled up sketchbooks and took tons of photographs and so on. So we tried to do a little bit of sculpting um, in the field, but um, from my point of view, I, I was not super successful as regards that. Um, and I came back and I had these grand ideas of doing, you know, tons of animal, uh, of African animal sculptures. But as I was working back here in Los Angeles on African animals, I, I almost felt like I was being a little bit disingenuous. I didn't really know these animals that well. I'd only seen them for a very short period of time. And I actually struggled um, artistically with, um, with doing some of them. Um, and it was only after that experience and, and after trying to sculpt um, the, the African animals that I thought, well, I either go back to Africa and live there for you know, an extended period of time, which, which was not really a, feas a feasible option, um, or I do something else. And that's when I started to do a lot of figures, actually, mm. because I was here in Los Angeles, I was, I was in an urban environment, and I thought, well, um, perhaps I should uh, explore the, the human form um, so it was, it was a very interesting, Africa was a very interesting experience um, be, because on the one hand, it was just absolutely amazing. But on the other hand, yeah, I, I, I really struggled with how, how I could maintain integrity in the animals without seeing them, you know, multiple times, you know. Uh, so do you think you need to immerse yourself in the subject? I know like George Carlson, he went to live with a tribe of yeah. Indians in, in Mexico, I think the Tarahumara. Yeah. Um, is that what, do you, when you were creating a movie, are you completely, like, I know Rodin would get the barber, I mean, the tailor from Balzac to see exactly, you know, just really in depth. Like, do you yeah. think you need to really get into it completely? Yeah, I, yeah, I think you do. And I mean, you know, when we're doing movie stuff, I mean, we really get into it as well, you know, equally um, as much as I would when I'm doing doing animals. Yeah, um, I think immersing yourself in everything that's pertinent and and informs the job you're doing is is kind of important. I, I would imagine um, all artists really do that. Um, you, you know, uh, it's uh, yeah, it, it, it's it, you really need to do your homework. I mean, it, it's a sacrifice for sure, I think, because because you're, I guess that's another question. I mean, you have your fine art and then you have the job where you have to do sculpture. Hmm. And I know you had to make a, you could have easily survived it just on sculpture. <laughs> and <laughs> on some regards, like by having another job source of income, it keeps you pure. You're not just doing commissions you don't want to take or doing what's mm. popular to sell. So what advice would you give to people who most of the time they have no choice because it's so expensive to cast bronze. How do yeah. you balance your life? I mean, you might have kids, you might have other things going on. Like how much sacrifice do you need to give to really make this work? Oh, um, well, you mentioned balance. I mean, but that, that's really it. Dan, that takes a long time to, to figure out a good balance, a good work-life balance. Um, because also sculpture is, is, I find it quite time consuming. Um, it, it's, uh, it takes a long time for me to, to, to create a piece. Um, and, you know, it, yeah, I actually, I was a little bit at a crossroads and, and, Oddly enough, it was people like Floyd and George who kind of cautioned me and said, do you really want to just quit what you're doing and, and, uh, and, and be a full-time sculptor? Because, you know, the, the, 
you, you have to make a living at it. You know, you have to, your bills have to be paid and so on and so right. forth. Certainly in my case. And, um, and so I could very well have easily found myself having to uh, make pieces because, you know, that would dictate it, say, from, by galleries, for example. Oh, we need another one of those. Or can you do another elephant? Can you do another this, that, and the other, you know? And that's not really why I'm doing my own sculpture. I'm doing my own sculpture just you know, to explore my own um, thoughts and um, and uh, my own uh, uh, reactions to um, to whatever subject it may, may be. In my case, it's animal. Um, so, um, so in many respects, keeping working uh, you know uh, at the creature shop and doing all that as time consuming as that is um it did allow me to be unencumbered with the business side of, of fine art if you if you if you will um and so i was able to pursue um my own my own path in that regard um but it is it is a it is a bit of a balance um and um you know, so, so sometimes you just don't you just don't get to where you need to be um, because of other commitments. You know, but I would imagine that's the case for a lot of uh, for a lot of people. Quite frankly, you know, it, it's it's it, I'm, you know, hats off to people who can um, who have a, a, a burgeoning sculpture career and do that. So you know, solely do that and, and be an artist full time. I, I admire that. Um, it's never really financially worked out. For me in that regard um and you mentioned the expense of bronze as well yeah that that in itself is um you know i i found that back when well i guess this was before before all the um the sort of internet really took you know had an impact on galleries so i'm talking about the 90s late 90s perhaps early 2000s um you know i found that the inventory that i needed to keep in order to keep the galleries stocked was just like tens of thousands of dollars, you know, and uh, it it was a uh, yeah I, that so financially there there was a there was a sacrifice there, you know, um, but uh, you know. <laughs> no, I mean, I agree. When I first started school doing bronzes, I just maxed out credit cards. Yeah, I had over forty thousand dollars of credit card debt just from casting bronzes yeah and starting out i thought just because you have a gallery and they say give me 10 pieces like they would kind of dictate what i did for a long time or what i cast and i think mm. over the years i learned to be better with business and i paid off that debt mm. and i remember i'm slowly like i don't listen to really galleries i mean i take their advice but i don't let them tell me what to do and i one time asked walter mattia i said how much do you let galleries tell you what to sculpt? He's like, not at all. Like that, he acts like that was the stupidest question in the world, which I think it may be. <laughs> and I mean, it goes to the fact, sculpting what you want to do. For instance, I took a workshop with Stanley Blyfeld before he passed right. many years ago. And he had a one-on-one -on -one session where he looks at your work and gives you a critique. Mm -hmm. He just looked at my work and just kind of looked at me and he said, is this what you want to do? <laughs> and I was sculpting, trying to be like Richard McDonald. It was a horrible figurative work. <laughs> and he said, this doesn't seem like something you'd be interested in. He says, like, who do you like? I said, I like uh, Marino Marini. I like oh. Manzu. I like Giacometti. And he says, we'll do that. He says, what do you do for work? I said, I'm a chemist. He says, if you're going to do this stuff, just quit and just be a chemist. Don't bother sculpting. And he said, you might be surprised. My whole life, people told me what I do wasn't sculpture. And I guess the whole point of that is finding your truth. So did you go through something like that where you had to figure out what you wanted to do or how you're going to sculpt? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And I know what Stanley was saying there. Um, I mean, I didn't have I didn't have the exact same conversation with him. Uh, but um, it was along those lines. Um, as a matter of fact, he he um, he sort of said, "Oh, you you know, you can sculpt, you can sculpt anything you want." 
I can see that you know you, you're you're um, a talented you, you know you've got great technical skills because um, I did a workshop with him and I'd already done like tons of sculpture in the movies by the time I'm you know probably 10 years before I did did Stanley class um, and he said but you've got to figure out what you want to do you know if you want to actually do uh, sculpture as such um, and I walked away and I thought oh yeah once again that's a kind of a deep deep question for me um, you know what the hell do I want to do sculpturally you know um, uh, um There's also a point, a point where, <clears throat> how can we say that for me, I, I have to do it. You know, the, 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 there's, it, it's just something in me that I just need to make something. And I've always been like that, even from being a young kid, you know, just, I've always wanted to make something. Um, I, I really enjoy that aspect of, of my life, you know, being able to create something. Um, and so, and, and particularly sculpture, there is something for me about having, um, about building a structure that physically takes up space. I, I, I like the workmanlike atmosphere, um, um, what can I say, the workmanlike um, process of building sculpture. Um, I, I've never really got into painting too much. Um, it, it, it was almost a little bit too, um, um, it, not ephemeral, but, but, but esoteric or, you know, it's, it's like I'm creating the illusion of space mm -hmm. in a painting. With sculpture, you, you're dealing with space. You're literally dealing with it and, and manipulating it and, and, and how the form works within the space. And, and I don't care what, what type of sculpture you're doing, it, I, I think that that's the same for all, whether it be abstract or, you know, cubist or, or um, minimalist sculpture, or whether it be really tight, you know, kind of figurative sculpture, we're, we're all dealing with how the forms work in space. And, um, and I, I'm, I'm really turned on by that, by that whole, that, by that, just that aspect of it. And so every time I've dipped in and out of sculpture and, you know, maybe I've done it for a couple of years or so, you know, um, Really, in a, in a in a concentrated manner, um, I I always keep coming back to it, and I always get a great thrill of doing it. Um, so that in itself is what keeps me going, and I suspect that's what keeps most artists going is the the fact that they they almost have to do it, um, and, um, and and once we get to a certain level, like we're you know we're in a level where you know we've shown work and and so on and so forth. The, the, you know, that brings a whole other um, set of things that you have to deal with. But even if I wasn't showing, even if I wasn't doing it, I'd still be wanting to create something. You know, it, it's it's, uh, it's it's something that's in me, um, and that speaks to this thing of, uh, you know, I get a lot of people, um, as you can imagine, asking me about how how do you get into the the movie industry? How do you get how do you get to make creatures in the movie industry? I think one of the main things, uh, one of the fundamental things really is, is you've really got to want to do it. You've really got to want it, you know. Um, and then secondly, th there's a good deal of luck involved, but when that door opens or when that luck um, presents itself, if you've done your homework, you're ready to step up and, and and um, uh, step up to the occasion. You're you're ready, you know. And so I'll tell people this when they come around the, the creature shop. Okay, if I said to you, um, I've got a job. Can you start Monday? Would you be ready to start? You know. Do you know? I mean, whatever it may be, design, sculpting, or mold making, whatever. You know, would you be ready? Would you have the chops <laughs> at your, you know? available that you could just step in and start work and if you if you're not at that point you need to go back do you do more homework and and, and get to a point where you're confident that you're, because um otherwise you just you're just kind of a fan and you're expecting that somebody else will carry the you know carry your work for you and and that that ain't going to cut it you know 
well, let's say that you're doing this, you have the drive, you're putting mm. in the time, mm. you have mentors who are good, and you're not getting better. In other words, your tech, whatever you're trying to sculpt does not look like that. Mm. And I've known the people like this who have done this for 30 years, taken workshops with me over and over again, and they never seem to improve. And mm. at, and they have dreams of becoming like a famous well-known sculptor and you look at the work hmm. maybe natural no natural known talent and i've i've met some of these people and i know the best answer i've heard so far is from john coleman what he says kind of lean into what you're bad with if bad at in other words you have a natural tendency to do something Take Jackson Pollock, who worked with Thomas Hart Benton. Yeah. He would never let Thomas Thomas Hart Benton do the drawings for the murals because he was such a horrible draftsman. Hmm. So I guess my question is you. So let's say you have the drive, you want to be an artist, whether Hollywood or not. What's your next step? I mean, do you keep pushing? Do you try to do something else? Do you try to expand what you do? Ooh. <coughs> um, excuse me. <coughs> Well, that's a hard question to answer um, because it, I guess it would vary on each individual. Um, well, let's just say a sculptor who's trying to do fine art, it doesn't look like the model they're trying to do, no matter yeah. how hard they work. Uh, well, you see, there again, it, it depends on what they as an individual is a, uh, trying to achieve. You know, oftentimes people get caught up in... Um, wanting something to look like something. Well, what does that mean? You know, are you going to do a photographic representation of, say, the model? Because if that's your intent, then there's a whole bunch of work that you're, you're going to have to need to do, you're going to have to do in order to produce something that is, you know, really tight and photographically realistic. Um, but if they, if their intent is to give an impression of the model, then um, you know, I mean, Marina Marini, you mentioned. Well, his figures are—you wouldn't call them photographically real, right? You know, but um, but there is a um, there's a tremendous uh, integrity to to Marina's work. Um, and so that's probably if I was in a situation I'd trying to you know talk to someone who who had those kind of desires and, and perhaps lacked some technical skill, I think you'd have to delve into exactly what their intent was in the work that they were trying to produce. Um, because if they were if they if they realized that it was possible not that you didn't have to be slavishly um, accurate with anatomy and so on and so forth, but your intent was to convey a beautiful gesture. Maybe it might be liberating for them to um, to just concentrate on the gesture and not get so bogged down in, you know, does it have five toes and, you know, five fingers and so forth. Um, That's a good answer. I asked this question because this is how I felt a lot of the time. I did a summer session years ago with the Florence Academy of Art. Hmm. And people are doing these fantastic, like, monument-worthy sculptures of the human figure. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing this for, like, 10 years. I'm like, oh, my God. I how am I going to compete with these people? Because they're so much better technically than I am. And, you know, it was, I think then I just stopped doing the figure for the most part. And I yeah. figured out what I really love is animals. And I found a good mentor. So Rod Zulo really showed me so much. And he was a wonderful mentor. And mm -hmm. um, like those mentors change you. Like how did Floyd do it? Is there a before and after Floyd do it? <laughs> Yes, there most certainly is a before and after. Yeah, um, Floyd was yeah was a very um, he, he was a very influential person to for me to be around, and um, it, it went from me just admiring his work and you know being very uh, how can I say um, sort of nervous around him. It developed into a long term friendship where we just get on the phone and just shoot the breeze very regularly and uh, towards the end of his life a few years ago you know we get on the phone quite a bit um 
And yeah, Floyd was influential. Uh, the, the, the thing about Floyd was that he was, um, you, you, you kind of wanted to ask him, how did you do this? And how did you do that? And how blah, 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 blah. And he'd never give you a straight answer because, mm, know. Yes. you know, and, and, but I now know why. You know, it took me a long time. It was frustrating many years ago, but now I know why. It's because once again, he was like, no, you've got to figure it out. I figured it out my way. You figure it out your way. You know, um, sure, there are certain technical things which we can dis which we could discuss and, and which we did, you know, but it, it, it took me a long time to figure out some, some of the things that, that Floyd would say, you know, um, and, um, and, and how that relates to my own work, you know. So, so, so he was very, um, he, again, he was quite liberating in a way. He was a very free thinking uh, person. Uh, I appreciated all the time uh, that, that we spent together and you know, even just getting on the phone and uh, shooting the breeze w was, uh, yeah, it was very good. So be before Floyd, I was on a certain path um, and, and he really, I think he really pushed me to, to be more um, mindful and more, you know, think more deeply about what I'm doing. Well, I know with Floyd, from what I know of him, I'm not an expert, of course, is it seems everything he sculpted was a metaphor for something else. It was a grand vision uh, and... I know Stanley was similar. You say you start with an idea before you start with the sculpture. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, that's a kind of daunting task to put in like his four horsemen was like the apocalypse. Yeah. To put that in the sculpture is pretty difficult. I mean, how much do you take that into your sculpture versus just sculpting because you like to sculpt like an animal? Good question, actually, because, I, I, I had this conversation with Floyd many times. You're right, met the metaphor was, was his thing. Um, and I used to argue, I said, why do, why do I have to tell a story? You know, why do I have to, why is this? Why can't I just sculpt an animal for just for mm -hmm. the sake of sculpting an animal? You know? Um, and, you know, you mentioned Rembrandt Bugatti, for example. Well, I mean, I, I get the feeling Bugatti was just sculpting something he loved. I don't mm -hmm. really think there's any deep sort of metaphorical stories behind his, behind his uh, sculptures. Um, so, um, so in my case, I'm not really starting with a meta. I mean, I don't feel like my animals are, are a metaphor for, for anything really. Uh, um, how can I qualify that? The, the, <clears throat> I got to this hour, I'm at the stage at the moment where I'm trying to um maintain an integrity in my sculptures of animals in that they can exist as animals so i'm not humanizing them in any way and i, I sometimes felt that um, when we were dealing with metaphor maybe which is a human uh, concept uh, you know anthropomorphizing if you if you, if you will um was something that I was really trying and am still trying to avoid. So I'm trying to show, uh, say, a mountain lion for what it is. But at the same time, I'm deeply concerned with how the forms connect and how the light hits the metal and, and so on and so forth, and how I want to give the, the viewer a, a sense of the... Um, of the um, how can we say, not necessarily power, but the, uh, uh, the presence, the sense of the presence of this particular animal, which is not necessarily a metaphor for anything, in my case, you know. Um, no, I agree, like in front of, I've sculpted mountain lions for many years and you're in front of there, front of the exhibit, you have a sense of fear because you have an apex predator, like mm. a few feet from you and, there's a beauty to it too and if, if you can capture some of that in a sculpture i mean that's just amazing to me i mean that's mm. as powerful as a metaphor to me mm. but, and of course, know, sorry Floyd, oh, sorry mark but Floyd, you know i mean everybody's comes from a different background as well you know floyd was in in 
Holland for a long time and um, like 30 years. And so, I mean, he, he was in that Dutch, you know, he studied within that Dutch tradition. And, and, and so it, it's, um, you, you know, I didn't have that kind of training, you know, and uh, so, so he was, you know, he was coming out of a, he was coming out of a different kind of um, era, if you like, different generational right. thought process, you know. Well, I want to stop my questions just for a moment because I'm sure other people have questions. Yeah, absolutely. And if Gwen, if you could moderate, just if people have certain questions. Sure, we have a few in the chat room. Um, uh, Lawrence is asking, he says, you speak of working from an interior impulse. You have to do it. I agree, but to work... But to do work which speaks to or for a community can also be artistically stimulating. Would you agree? Yeah. I remember very well the mentor for a writing workshop saying your job as a writer is to give the reader an experience. Is there not a corollary with the sculpture the, uh, or the fine arts? Absolutely, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's very well put. So when you're doing your movie sculpting, sculpting, are you sculpting for that community? Are you sculpting for yourself or both? Oh, well, uh, I guess a bit of both. But yeah, but no, you absolutely have the, the audience in mind. Absolutely. Yeah, you have the audience definitely in mind. Um, and, and, and um, <clears throat> you know, particularly if you're dealing with a property that has a, a large fan base, for, for example, um, you, 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 we have to bear in mind, you know, be, be faithful to the to the design so that the fans will appreciate our work. Yeah, and and I, I like what Lawrence said about there about interior and impulse, and and yet at the same time, you know, working for a, um, um, you know, working for an audience. I I think that's true, uh, uh, very true. I mean, even though I'm saying I'm doing my own thing, you know, I I want it. I want it to connect with people. I want what I do to connect with people for sure, um, and certainly with the movies, I want I want that I want what we do to connect with people as well. So then, Charlene Potter, and she may have to unmute and ask this herself, but it says, "Do you work with in mental imagery?" A mental image, do you say? Mental imagery. Charlene, do you want to clarify that question? I don't know if, if, do you mean from memory or? Not? No, um, well, I use mental imagery um, as, as uh, I visualize it and then I create it. Okay. And I, uh, does that help uh, a little bit? Thank you. Uh, yeah, okay, there you go. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, um, yeah, I think, well, yes, memory. Um, I, I use my memory an awful lot. Um, I mean, many times, particularly when I'm doing, doing an animal sculpture, I won't be looking at anything other than just the piece and trying to figure it out. Um, but that, but the memory that I have of uh, it, it just comes from a lot of observation. Um, but yeah, I think I think we do have a mental image of what we want a piece to to look like. Um, and then it's, it's the, the, the process of building it is, you know, how close can we get to the thing that's in our, that was the impulse in our mind. Thank you. And um, uh, there's a sculptor, a sculptor asking, where you cast your pieces? I'm a local Los Angeles sculptor oh. and would like to know where you cast. Oh, well, I, I've dotted around a bit, but but the, for the bulk of the um, time, and, and certainly right now, I'm casting my pieces at a place called American Fine Arts Foundry, which is in Burbank. Um, uh, and it's, uh, it's been around for a long time. Um, I started there like 30 years ago, and, and it had already been in existence at that time. Um, and yeah, American Fine Arts uh, Foundry in Burbank is where I currently uh, Currently cast, but there are a few places in Los Angeles. I know other sculptors in Los Angeles who who cast at different uh, different foundries. Yeah. 
But I mm-hmm. like them. They, 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 I work well with that particular foundry, and they let me do, you know, they let me come in and, and do, you know, work on wax and, and metal and patinas and things. So. Right. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I know, Mark, that you had twice as many questions, but it is nearly six o'clock. <laughs> right. Is it? Oh. Um, and we, we've actually addressed the meet, the questions in the chat room because I think you answered so many just in conversation, which was lovely. Um, so if it's all right, I would just like to thank you both so much for doing this and encourage anyone who does think of questions afterwards, that happens quite often, please just you know call or email us and, and we'll be sure to either connect you with Peter or, or we'll find the answer for you. Um, and Peter, when can where can we follow your work, or where can we see more of what you've done? Good question. You know, I literally I'm putting a website together now, so hopefully in a couple of weeks, uh, probably more like four or five weeks, I'll have a website up. Um, and uh, I've been a little bit tardy about that, I guess. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> we'll and just, I'll just Google you. mentioned that Peter has a, a a large number of wildlife sculptures of big cats and I'm hoping he has a really big show sometime soon so <laughs> some of it you see behind him yeah I'd love to we will be posting a recording of this on our website and at the end um perhaps you'll have your website ready and we can put, yeah. put that at the end yeah so um thanks so much again for your time and the thoughtful conversation and thank you to everyone for joining. Also, a, a quick shout out to, I noticed in the in the audience, I recognize most of you. Um, and I, I want to talk to all of you, but I did want to give a shout out to Nikki Blyfeld, Stanley's wife, who is present. Mm. And also to Bart and Lynn Walter. You, you oh. mentioned Bart traveling in Africa with Bart. So yeah. they are oh. here as well. So I, I just wanted to, to hear your that. voice, Peter. Oh my goodness, Bart! Oh. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah. Well, Gwen, on, it's been a long you. time. It's been a long time, Bart. Yeah. Oh man, we should get together. Um, I, uh, Gwen, thank you, thank you so much, Gwen, thank you for um, for asking me to, um, uh, um, you know, to have a talk with you. I, I, I really appreciate. Appreciate it, and thanks everyone for for listening to me uh, ramble on here. <laughs> it's been great, thank you. And I, our next online event is actually our annual meeting, which is, believe it or not, next year, only two months away though, um, in January. So you'll all receive an email about that. So I hope to see you on screen again. And thanks again for joining. Thank you, Peter. Have a great thank rest you. of the week. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.